Hey listeners, it's Paul Andriola here. Why not join our community at Small Cap Discoveries where we offer our members direct access to some of the best microcap investment opportunities available. Our members are getting access to premium microcap financings, research reports, and direct access to management. Sign up today at www.smallcapdiscoveries.com. Hi everyone, welcome to the Small Cap Discoveries conference call. Today is October 3rd, 2024, and today on our call we have the VP John Ripplinger from Emaflex. Emaflex trades on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol IFX, and it also trades on the OTC under IFLXF. The company is currently trading at $1.39 with about 52 million shares outstanding or about a $72 million market cap. I'd now like to hand it over to Paul Andriola. Hey, thanks, Trevor. Um, yeah, great to have uh, John back with us. It's been a little while since we last spoke, John. Um, and yes. uh, yeah, and uh, by looking at the share price, uh, we should have been talking to you a lot sooner um, <laughs> over the last little while here. It's stock's done quite well. Uh, so we'd love to get some idea of what's been causing it and uh, obviously any updates. So why don't we jump into that? But um, I understand you've got a presentation. So I'm just going to hand it over to you. Sounds great. I think everybody can see the deck uh, okay from what I understand. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks to uh, Paul, of course, and Trevor for organizing uh, today's event and, uh, and giving Imaflex the opportunity to uh, once again present to the uh, uh, Small Cap uh, Discoveries uh, group. It's been a number of times now. So I think most of you uh, know the story, but I thought we'd start off today just with a quick snapshot of, uh, of Imaflex, and then we'll look at some of the current events that have happened uh, over the past year or so since we uh, last spoke. Um, just the usual stuff before I begin, uh, remember that today's remarks could contain forward-looking statements, and I invite you to uh, read the Safe Harbor. It's available on our website and most of the uh, corporate uh, documents. Um, so with that, let's let's jump in and take a look at uh, who is Emiflex, what do we do? And then again, as I said, we'll look at the uh, current events. So Emiflex manufactures and sells products for the flexible packaging and the agricultural space. Uh, the company was established back in 1994 by three individuals. Those uh, individuals brought a solid experience in extrusion, which is a making of the plastic film and also in converting, which is a printing and bag making side. So you take a film, you then convert it by printing on it, making bags, et cetera, and away you go. And now we have started out with one uh, plant. Now today, uh, we started in 1994, as I said. Now today in 2024, we've got three manufacturing facilities, two of those being in Quebec and one of them in Thomasville, North Carolina. Now in 2023, we had revenues of around $95 million. We are profitable, we have a healthy capital structure, and we have a track record of uh, growth. So just to look at the business a little bit uh, closer, um, we primarily manu manufacture films for the converting industry. That's about 95% of our business. The other 5% is on the agricultural side. On the flexible packaging side, uh, when I talk about converters again, those are the guys that take our film and they make the finished product. So they print on the film, they uh, make bags, and away you go. Now that could be used for a number of different things, for frozen foods, pet foods, meats, dairy, fruit, vegetables, lawn and garden products such as soil bags, wood chip bags, construction material that goes on the outside of houses. You've seen uh, those type of uh, Tyvek films, et cetera. Uh, so uh, we would make that and, uh, and away you go. Now, uh, in Canada, we sell mostly to converters. In the U.S., uh, back in 2019-2020, uh, we did a, a, a basically a capital equipment purchase program. We bought a new printer, we bought a new extruder, and we had much more to offer in terms of moving up the value chain by offering our customers a one-stop shop, i.e. doing the extruded material and then the printed product and the end, end product, the bag, et cetera, and then selling directly to the end user. So a one-stop shop in the U.S., and on the Canadian side, more of the film sold to converters. We can offer the final product as well here, and we would get that shipped up from the U.S., for example. Now, in addition, all the waste that we have in the manufacturing process, we make industrial products, so tire bags, garbage bags. We take that waste, we make those, uh, those uh, particular types of products, and uh, we use them and sell them and make money from them. So it's a nice thing both from our side of the business from a, uh, a revenue perspective, 
but also from an environmental perspective as well. On the agricultural side, we uh, sell the full gamut of ag films, your traditional mulch and barrier films, uh, mulch films used for water retention uh, to uh, control weeds, uh, the barrier films to reduce nuisance odors, stop evaporation. We have metallized film to promote gross growth, sorry, and uh, to uh, basically uh, have insect control as well as uh, uh, compostable films. Now we have compostable films on the ag side and on the flexible packaging side. It is not a big seller right now, but we are ready. We have films made with uh, what we call polylactic acid or PLA. Those are films made with cornstarch or films made with uh, chemically modified resins to be fully certified to be uh, biodegradable within 180 days. Uh, so we can offer those. Not a big seller. The reason being it is uh, quite a bit uh, more costly. And uh, these days when you go to the grocery store, when you go to the lawn and garden center, uh, people are very uh, touchy with respect to pricing. And as a result, uh, it hasn't been a big seller, but we're ready for it as it moves down the pipe. Now, uh, in terms of what's next, what's happened over the past year? Well, we've got um, a number of things on the uh, agricultural side. Uh, we've got Abyssil and on the uh, flexible packaging side, we have um, uh, new equipment. So back in 2022, we announced a new equipment program. And let's just look at the next slide, which talks about that uh, if we can. Um, so 2022, we were reaching maximum capacity on our uh, multi-layer extrusion equipment. Now, when we talk about multi-layer extrusion equipment, that type of, uh, of extruder allows you to produce films that can be used for um, uh, more complicated food packaging. So things like for cheeses, for meats, et cetera. It has higher barrier properties to protect and preserve those products. Uh, and as a result, we were finding that the uh, current uh, multi-layer extruders that we have were reaching full capacity in 2022. So we went out and we announced a, uh, a multi-year a capital equipment program, which is now beginning to wind down. That was about 25 to $28 million of spending that we've had on that particular uh, uh, purchases. We uh, acquired three new multi-layer extruders, as well as a metalizer. It doubled our multi-layer extrusion capacity and increased our overall capacity by about 20%. Basically in increased our capacity between 12 to 15 million pounds of film annually. Now, as I mentioned to you earlier, this allows you to move up the value chain by offering better barrier packaging uh, options. And in addition, it allows you to benefit from scale. So reducing the overhead and labor costs, et cetera, on the, uh, on the company because of that scale that you're getting. Now, to date, we have the first of the three layer extruders uh, that is up and running. It is fully operational, as is the metalizer. And we also had bought and some bought some uh, bag machines, which are also operational. The two remaining extruders have been received, and they are currently being commissioned. So by Q4, we should see those uh, two extruders uh, fully commissioned. And just so we can manage expectations, it's not a light switch effect. What happens is when you get those extruders in line, it takes about 18 months for them to become fully utilized. So we'll see the good, true uh, benefits. We're already seeing benefits. But the big benefits will come in 2025 and 2026 as those extruders really start to produce and uh, become uh, more uh, utilized. Now, in terms of the other opportunity, we've spoken about Advisil before. Uh, we've got two slides on this today because we have spoken about it. But just to give you a quick update as to where we stand on Advisil. So Advisil, just to remind you, uh, is a, a product that has been designed to replace what we consider to be the wasteful and harmful practice of chemical fumigation. What growers do today right now to get land ready for growing season, they have to sanitize the soil. So they inject pesticides into the soil. So nematicides, fungicides, herbicides to kill the insects, the weeds, the fungi. And this is subject to overdosing, underdosing, often requires protective gear. Once that uh, chemical has been put in the soil, they come along and they cover that soil with a plastic film immediately to keep the bad odors in the soil and to keep those chemicals that they've just injected from evaporating into the air. They wanna keep them in the soil to sanitize it. So what we've done, we've eliminated the step for the injection of the chemicals. We've kept the step, which is to cover the land with, uh, with the film. The only thing with us is the chemicals are on the film that we have. So you take that film, you cover the land with the, uh, the film itself, 
and those chemicals are released into the soil in a very safe, timely, and cost-effective manner. It reduces chemical usage by over 95%. It is safe to handle, transport, and apply the film itself, and it increases productivity, it decreases costs, and it's good for the environment. Now, in 2024, we already have many patents, but in 2024, uh, we received a new patent from the United States Patent and Trademark Office, which I think shows you that they, we definitely have something there which people think is patentable, uh, and that is valid until 2041. So really recognizing once again the uh, novel uh, IP that we have with respect to Ab Abacil. Now, Abacil, uh, just quickly on this, we did two independent field trials to check it out and see if it should go to the EPA. One was to check the efficacy. Does it work? If it doesn't work, well, you're not going to go ahead with it. The second and more important one is the safety. The EPA, uh, <clears throat> they're happy it works. But if it's not safe, well, forget it. So uh, we did the two trials. They were independent. The first trial, again, does it work? It was looking at, does it sanitize the soil? And two, is the plant growth yield and quality comparable to the current grower standard using fumigants? And that study there, we found that it worked. The uh, soil was sanitized. And on top of that, the growth yield and quality was comparable to the grower standard. With respect to the release study, we had to show that there was enough time lapse between when the chemicals enter the soil and when that plant is picked for safe human consumption. It has to be a certain period of time to show that it's safe. They've entered the soil, a period of time has passed, you pick the crop and it's, uh, it's a safe period. So we, again, once uh, we're, again, we were able to show that it was safe, we met the requirements and with that, we went ahead and we made, made the EP registration. Well, that was well over a year ago that we submitted that to the EPA. And unfortunately, it's taken longer than we anticipated. Uh, this, you know, we have had some delays or hiccups over the past number of years, some of them due to Imiflex. But in this case here, it's really just a waiting game. Other companies are in similar um, waiting periods uh, as, uh, as us. And uh, we expect to receive a decision. But when that will be exactly, uh, we are not sure. In the meantime, we're answering questions that come through, and uh, we, we should know something uh, over the next year or so. We'll, we'll see. Now, just looking at some of the current things uh, as well, uh, in the first half of this year, we came out, uh, uh, the board, uh, in discussions with them and the management team, uh, we put into a, one of our press releases, uh, you know, we were disappointed with where the share price uh, is. And we just wanted to remind shareholders that we are fully committed to driving profitable, sustainable growth at, uh, at MFLEX. And uh, management with the board regularly evaluates strategic options. Uh, that could be the capital equipment program, which I just mentioned to you that we put into play. And it could be more things, smaller things like a nor normal course issuer bid or a special dividend or a dividend. It could be bigger things such as a small tuck-in, or it could be possibly the sale of the company. We are uh, committed to driving value, and uh, right now with a strong balance sheet, and then a balance sheet that's actually uh, growing stronger by each uh, quarter with stronger cash flows, we believe that we are in a very good position uh, to drive growth going forward. Now, one of the other things that we announced uh, earlier this year is that Joe, uh, the CEO, would be uh, stepping down from that role, maintaining uh, the chairman role, in fact, moving into the executive chairman role. So keeping the chairman plus moving into a bit of a strategic slash operational role as well. So we have a smooth transition. We announced that that was underway. And uh, in uh, the past month or so, we announced that we had found a, a new CEO, uh, Stefan Yazidjian, uh, who will become president and CEO at the end of October. And he's a uh, really, we believe, uh, very good at providing us uh, with the support to take us uh, for the next uh, chapter of growth. Uh, he is a multilingual leader. He's worked in Canada. He's worked internationally. He's worked in a wide range of industries, including manufacturing. He has a track record of transforming businesses. He's got strong capital market experience. He's worked with uh, many of the brokerage houses that uh, you know in, uh, in Canada as well. Uh, and uh, he's completed over $25 billion in transactions over his career. So uh, we believe he's well equipped to be able to take us uh, uh, to the next level with his uh, with his um, uh, background. Now, all of this to say, uh, when we look at the results, um, just taking a little bit look at the history, 
2020 to 2022, we had solid results with record net income each of those years. The major equipment investments that I spoke about earlier, remember in 2019, 2020, we had bought an, uh, a multi-layer extruder, we bought a new um, uh, eight color press, and we saw some very interesting things in terms of growth from the company from a uh, bottom line net income perspective. We benefited from the impact of scale. And with that successful playbook back in 2022, when we were seeing that the new extruder that we had bought uh, earlier had uh, reached its almost its full utilization, we announced the uh, uh, basically a bigger uh, capital uh, purchase program with the uh, additional equipment that is now, as I mentioned to you earlier, coming online as we speak. And so we're using the same playbook as we did back in 2019, 2020, just at a bigger scale uh, this time. And uh, we expect to see some good things coming out of that. We already are starting to see some good things coming out of that, as you see in the year to date 2024 results. Before we talk on that, I want to talk about 23. Uh, 23 was a difficult year for Miflex. We, we, we remained profitable, but we had industry-wide challenges. We had a very competitive market. We had inventory drawdowns. So there was a big um, um, inventory uh, stock up during COVID. We had to get through that drawdown period. We have done that. Uh, and uh, now we've moved on as we uh, got into 24. That was completely um, uh, com well finished. Uh, as well, we had something called PFAS, uh, which is uh, more and more uh, states in the United in the US uh, are requiring companies to not use PFAS. PFAS is basically like if you have a non-stick pan um, that is coated with what's called a PFAS product to make it uh, smooth and slippery. Uh, well, that more and more um, businesses are moving away from that, which we did. And uh, because we were moving away from that, it meant the recipe changed. And as the recipe changes, it creates complexities. So we had to live with that. We got through that and we have now um, got the recipes fine tuned to be able to allow us uh, to produce at the levels we were seeing uh, before we made that changeover. And of course, the economy. I mean, people were less likely to go out and buy, you know, uh, three bags of soil. They'd buy one or two bags of soil. And so there was less demand for our product. Construction industry slowed down, less demand for some of our construction films. And as a result, we saw the industry-wide challenges. In 2023, we were also um, hit by a couple of things. One, we had a non-cash uh, $1 million uh, obsolete equipment write-off. We had a new printer, uh, not a new printer, an old printer that uh, that we wrote off for one million bucks, and we had some FX headwinds that were around two point one million. So uh, that uh, hurt us as well. Twenty twenty four, as I said to you, solid recovery. So let's look at that for a second. As you see on the left side there, uh, we had solid top line and bottom line growth for twenty twenty four year to date. We've seen. Uh, Nice uh, increase in uh, net income, almost 300% increase. EPS up by seven cents to 10 cents versus three cents in the first uh, six months of 2023. We've seen significant year over year gains in volume, and that's across the business. It's not only um, our, our monolayer films, our converted films are, are, are um, seeing very good growth in the United States, and these are higher margin offerings. We're seeing the benefits of the new equipment that we had, the metalized film, which is also a higher margin offering. And uh, we will continue to see those benefits going forward as the new equipment ramps up more and more. In addition, uh, as of the end of Q2, we have a much improved uh, balance sheet. It was already strong, but we improved it more. We brought our line of credit down to nil, to nothing. We paid off $4.2 million in Q2. And uh, we brought it down to nil, as I said, we now have 12.7 million available in liquidity, which includes 700,000 of cash and 12 million in our line of credit. And we have net debt of around 10.9 million. That includes 700,000 of uh, the cash that I spoke about this a second ago, includes 600,000 of debt and 11 million of leases. Under the leases, we have about 7 million relating to the new equipment that we acquired. So as you can see, we funded most of those new equipment purchases with the cash flow that we have in the company. I mentioned to you, we spent around $25, $28 million on that new equipment. So most of it done through cash flows, but we do have a lease of about $7 million at the end of Q2. We also have some leases for the manufacturing facilities that we, uh, that we have, and that constitutes the remaining 4 million to make up that 11 million of leases. In addition, in Q2, we generated 5.2 million of free cash flow 
So really starting to see those free cash flow numbers go up again. As you may recall, back in 2020 to 2022, we had very nice cash flows and we expect to get that again uh, going forward over the medium term. We'll get back into that. And also helping that is the investing activities, all that money that we were spending on the new equipment while we're returning to historical norms. We spent around $900,000 in Q2 of this year. That number will continue to go down and on an annual basis, we should see about uh, two to four million dollars in terms of growth capex and maintenance capex uh, going forward. Now we've been able to do this in an environment which main, re remains uh, very competitive. Uh, we've indicated that over the medium term we do see uh, growth going forward, uh, but we believe that we are very well positioned uh, to be able to deliver on that and maintain uh, a good uh, balance sheet if there are any challenges that we should meet. So um, Paul was alluding to the fact that our stock has seen some uh, some good growth. Uh, and I think that the performance that we've seen over the past uh, few quarters is a key driver behind this. Um, we uh, continue to believe that the uh, stock is uh, still attractive. When you look at the multi multiples, debt debita, price to sales, price to book value, EV debita, they're still at attractive uh, levels. Uh, we believe uh, and uh, and uh, we will continue to focus on delivering uh, uh, growth for the company going forward and we'll see what happens uh, with respect to the uh, stock price speaking of uh, the stock price our market caps around 72 million dollars we uh, have a 52 week high of about a buck 65 a 52 week low of around 70 cents and uh, insider ownership is around 55 percent so insiders are very well aligned with uh, the uh, shareholders uh, you know the success of the business also has a very big impact on them um, the last slide that i've got really is just you know so why imiflex imiflex so i i've spoken about these over the past uh, few minutes but uh, i i just want to summarize them uh, we are coming out of a very uh, difficult industry downturn 2023 was tough we remained uh, very, uh, not very profitable, we remained profitable. We saw a solid recovery uh, for the first half of 2024 on both the top and bottom line. We have a healthy capital structure with a solid balance sheet. The cash flows are uh, strengthening. We have the new equipment, which provides a solid platform for growth. Again, we're using the same playbook. It's not a new one that we're using here. We're using the same playbook that we had back in 2020, 2019 and uh, we're just doing it at a bigger scale at this point in addition our capital spending is going to return to historical norms we're focusing on asset utilization when it comes to the new equipment so making sure we've got boots on the ground to be able to get that equipment um, not only up and running but uh, get the sales in for that equipment as we speak in addition as i mentioned to you a second ago when we were, when we were looking at the um, the stock chart we're trading at what we believe are attractive levels, even though it has gone up nicely over the past uh, few uh, months. In addition, we are getting Advisil, we believe, for free. It's not reflected in the current stock price. If Advisil is successful, it could have a big impact uh, on the on the business and become actually a much higher revenue generator than uh, the uh, flexible packaging space. That said, just again, wants to uh, manage uh, expectations. Uh, when Advisil does come on, it's going to uh, be not a light switch effect again. We will be uh, we will be uh, prudent, and we'll roll it out uh, and uh, determine how we'll do that exactly. Whether it would be partnering with somebody or uh, doing it on our own, very unlikely we would do it on our own. Uh, but um, uh, we'll do it in a prudent fashion, and we'll see uh, a gradual uh, increase in revenues uh, over a period. In addition, I mentioned to you that board and management are well aligned with the investor interests. And uh, as we spoke about, we've got the new uh, CEO coming on board at the end of this month. And we believe that he's got the uh, the talent and abilities to be able to take us uh, to the next chapter in uh, Imovex uh, growth story. And that's it. Awesome, John. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> a couple key, key questions I want to ask. And uh, before I do that, I want to remind everybody if you've got questions, uh, just feel free to use the chat function and I'll ask John the question. Um, so we talked about new equipment. I'll, I'll start with that. Um, so you've got new equipment in place now, but do you, do you foresee any other additional significant CapEx, any other new equipment or uh, how does the CapEx spend look like over the next little while? 
yeah, nothing uh, major in the foreseeable future uh, at this point in time. We've got uh, the, the spend, as I said, about $25, $28 million over the past number of years. What we're focusing on right now is getting that equipment up and running, fully commissioned, and then fully, fully utilized over the next uh, number of years. Um, I also mentioned that we'll get back to historical norms. Historically, we were, we were between 2 to $4 million uh, per year. That's for your growth capex and your maintenance capex. So that's what we would expect to see. Over the past uh, couple of years, we've spent both when you look at 22 and 23, I think it was around $28 million. So some fairly major numbers there, but that's over with. And uh, we are now seeing a return back to the historical levels. So when, when do you think you're going to see the equipment sort of fully utilized or fully in place and and, and kind of what um, is an incremental sort of sign of growth you're going to get from that or or does it just flip the switch and all of a sudden you've got you got a big chunk of capacity that you didn't have yeah no so the way we did it will be the same thing using that playbook as i mentioned back in 2019 2020 uh is that uh the equipment will come on online there'll be a ramp up period mm-hmm. um it's already producing the new equipment the last two pieces that are, are, are uh, in uh, our u.s plant and our victoriaville plant are already up and running but it's not fully commissioned. So they're producing film, but not where we want to be in terms of full uh, barrier films. Um, mm-hmm. So that's up and running, and it'll take about 18 months for that extruder, once it is fully operational, to be fully utilized. So it takes a, it takes a period of about 18 months, so it's slow and steady. But what you'll do is if you have a five-layer extruder, you can produce three-layer extru- uh, films on that extruder. You'll take the business you have, and then you move up the value chain as you start getting more and more clients uh, that are interested in the product. One of the things that Imaflex has done over the years, and that could change with the new uh, CEO, uh, but uh, we have uh, specialized in smaller orders, customized solutions, and quick turnaround times. We have not taken on contracts. So uh, when we look at the new equipment coming online, um, we've got boots on the ground. Those guys are talking uh, to uh, people, to our customers. They're advising them about the uh, new equipment that's coming online. And so they're aware of it. Once that equipment is fully operational and tested, we'll be able to start taking orders for that. And you know, with anything, uh, they uh, want to be able to see that you can deliver. They want to be able to see that you can deliver on time and with respect to quality. So that will take a bit of time, but uh, we'll start to see the real benefits from this equipment in 2025 and into 2026. Gotcha. And um, let's let's talk about Adversil a little bit. Um, um, if everything goes well, what's the earliest you could see that in the marketplace? Yeah, that's that's a good question, and and that's one we can we we thought it would be out there by now. It's mm-hmm. unfortunate, but uh, it's before the EPA. Uh, you know, even in Canada, I've been talking with our trademark lawyers. We've been renewing things, and uh, they've said, "Look, uh, I know there's delays, but there's staffing issues, there's budgetary mm-hmm. issues, and we can't tell you when it's going to be approved." Uh, so it's it's uh, it's something that we face. It's something that other companies face. Uh, we are talking with the EPA. We're answering questions. It's just taking longer than we had anticipated. It, they, they could give us uh, an approval within six months. It could be a year. Uh, mm-hmm. We don't know exactly when it is. Once it does get approved, uh, we'll be in a position, uh, and Joe, the uh, the current CEO, has always said, you're in a much better position, bargaining position, once you have uh, sort of like an FDA-approved project when you're project product. When you're in phase three clinical trials, uh, you're in a much better bargaining uh, position. Mm-hmm. So if we get that approved by the EPA, then we start talking to people. And again, it could be talking with ag firms. It could be talking with people who do uh, coding. Uh, it could be talking with private equity. Uh, there's mm-hmm. a number of different avenues. It's unlikely that we would do it on our own. We have over the years, so we've worked with an outside firm that has told us exactly what we need to do in terms of getting an, a, a coding equipment manufactured for us. But uh, it's quite likely that we would uh, partner with somebody. And as I mentioned to you, um, it's something that would not be a light switch effect. It was something that would be uh, rolled out. And with growers, you're talking guy, about guys who, who are not early adopters. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, basically what will happen with them, they already use ag film, which is nice. But if they have, let's just make up some numbers here, 100,000 acres, maybe the first uh, growing season, they're going to use 5,000 acres of the film. Mm -hmm. Next growing season, if they see success, might be 10,000 acres. You'll see that ramp up. There has to be a comfort level there because it's one, uh, they're they're, 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 they're living and Mm -hmm. they have to make sure that they can produce a product that is the same quality, if not better, and that does 
give them cost savings as it's mm -hmm. uh, indicated by us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you ever tried to sort of gather what the addressable market is for for that product? Uh, yeah, it's it's it, in the U.S. It's huge because you know it's if you're looking at um, just the um, the ag market. I'm not talking about chemicals. You're talking in the U.S. about well billions of dollars. But if you're bringing in the chemical side of things, pre-plant. Just to remind you. Our film is for pre-plant, so it sterilizes the land before growing season. Mm -hmm. There's still chemicals you got to put on the plant after it's uh, in the ground, but for pre-plant, you're talking about uh, a significant. Uh, I don't want to give you a number, but it's in the multi, multi billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Got, gotcha, I gotcha. Um, okay, a couple questions came in. Why don't we jump on those, and then I'll I'll finish yep. off with my questions. Um, uh, Okay, we answer that question on CapEx. Um, uh, okay, so Paulo asks, will growth be lumpier when we see sequential Q over Q growth? Maybe give us a sense of, I imagine there's some seasonality, you're dealing with agriculture on, on a regular basis, but give us a sense of what to expect uh, quarter on a quarter basis. Yeah, uh, we're in our, our quiet period right now. We just entered it uh, this past week, but I can tell you uh, in our last uh, press release for Q2 results, we did indicate that uh, Q3, uh, as we have every year, uh, we have what in Quebec, we have a construction holiday. So uh, things shut down for a few weeks. Uh, and prior to that and after that, you get a bit of a slowdown as you get into the construction holiday then you have to ramp up again. So Q3 will be impacted by that as well. You have some holidays in the States. Uh, so we've indicated that in the release. And in addition, we have indicated that uh, that competition remains present and it is aggressive. Mm -hmm and that uh, we cannot fully predict exactly uh, what the market will be. But we do know over the medium term that uh, we uh, that we fully expect to see, uh, uh, you know, nice, uh, nice growth in the in the business. Mm -hmm. and, and quarter two or Q2 was a was a solid quarter. Is that something that um, was, was there? Was it an anomaly or is that sort of a little bit more back to normal from uh, from COVID days? Well, Q2, Q2 was very good. I mean, uh, it was it was a, it was a it was a good quarter. Q1 was a very good quarter as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw margins in Q2 that uh, were like gross profit margin was about 18 percent. Traditionally, back in 20, uh, 20, 21 and 22, we saw margins in the 15, 16 percent in terms of gross profit margins. Mm -hmm. We saw EBITDA margins in the 14 uh, or so percent. And I believe in Q2, they were around 16 percent. Uh, so, um, you know, that's that's where we were in the past. I'll let you guys decide what you want to use in terms of uh, any modeling. But uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and, um, so in that regard, though, Advisil, when you when you guys anticipate it being the market, what, what does that do to your margins? Um, I imagine a product like that probably skews your margins a little bit higher. Definitely. Yeah. I yeah. mean, when you talk about Advisil, you're talking about crop protection, EBITDA margins. You're talking, uh, you know. 30 plus percent uh, mm -hmm. EBITDA margins uh, as it comes on on the market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, Assuming yeah. it comes on the market. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So significantly better. Um, yeah. Listen, we talked about a lot of the good things that are going on, but how about challenges? What what challenges does business face? Apart from yeah. competition, well, you mentioned that a few times. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, definitely uh, that is that is a challenge for us. Um, and I think competition is the is is the biggest challenge and the uh, the fact is, as well, as I mentioned to you, we don't have uh, right now, uh, we don't have um, uh, contracts. Uh, so looking at the uh, the flow, uh, sales flow, it can be a bit more difficult than if you do have uh, contracts. The nice thing about not having contracts for us is that uh, you can get higher margins because you have the quick turnaround times, customized solutions and smaller orders, as I said to you. So they tend to come to you. They want it fast, faster than what they'll normally get it. So you say, OK, we'll give it to you but it's a bit of a higher uh, priced uh, product. Mm. Uh, so that uh, affects it uh, as well. Um, when we look at the, uh, the market overall, we're still, you know, we're still coming out of it. Uh, we still do have some uh, pressures uh, from the economy uh, that, uh, you know, demand out there in terms of the food products, people are still very price sensitive. So those things together um, have, um, you know, give us not cause for concern, but we have to be cognizant of that uh, when we're, uh, when we're speaking with the clients. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, uh, you do have the uh, usual things that come with uh, the plastics uh, industry. Now, we were uh, considered a, um, a business that was essential uh, during the COVID days. Uh, we do not 
make plastic bags for grocery stores that they used to use for food. We do not mm -hmm. make the plastic plates, plates and forks and all that stuff that they uh, use for food. And uh, frankly, going forward, uh, you know, I'm not sure what people would use uh, to protect and preserve meat products, uh, cheeses, etc. cetera, uh, if you uh, didn't use a, a barrier film like we have. Now, it could be more of a compostable film, uh, but right now uh, the focus is still on the kind of like the, uh, the traditional product. Mm -hmm. And um, you've got an operation in Canada, you've got an operation in the States. Is there, is there, um, is there any advantages right now, currency wise, or, or, you know, you're based in Canada. I mean, are you able to take advantage of that in some ways into the U S yeah. I mean, when the, when the U S dollar is stronger than Canada, it, uh, mm -hmm. it does give us some foreign exchange uh, benefits. Uh, definitely. Um, in addition, it gives us access to the U S markets uh, in, a, in a better fashion, making it the, uh, uh, Basically, uh, we're closer to the customer. Uh, we have uh, a good solid crew of U.S. Uh, salespeople down there that uh, allowing us to drive the business. And when you look at 2024, it's actually the U.S. operations that have been uh, really a solid contributor. Uh, we've seen good growth overall, but the U.S. operations with those converting operations that we have down there, it's been a nice contributor. So, yeah, there's definitely some advantages uh, having the U.S. business as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, perfect. Um, then... Like as we watch the company continue to move here uh, going forward, um, what, what do you think the important either metrics or maybe even catalysts to pay the most attention to, to 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 understand that you guys are going in the right direction? Yeah, well, I mean, I think what you want to be able to see uh, right now is that we have the new equipment that we announced that it's up and running and mm -hmm. fully commissioned. That you see that we're getting the benefits from that. I think that you should also see that we're getting the margins that come with that. That those are higher margin uh, extruders. So we should see uh, an improvement in, in the uh, margins versus our uh, 2023 numbers, for example. We should see also uh, messaging that comes out from the uh, new CEO. I think that he'll have his, uh, his uh, own ideas and uh, we hope to get people out uh, or him out uh, to the street to start talking to people and communicating that uh, in the coming months so once he's uh, put things uh, more into, uh, into place. Obviously, Abbasil as well is important mm -hmm. to look at. Uh, I think that uh, we want to be able to see that um, that's been approved. We believe it will, but uh, we still have to get that. And once it's approved, what's our next steps with that? You're looking for that to see if we've got a good uh, rollout plan as it comes to, uh, as it, with respect to Avacil. And then in addition, just uh, the cash flow numbers. I was talking about cash flows. I think that uh, when you look back in 2020, 21, 22, we had very nice uh, bank account. And uh, we want to get back to that and mm -hmm. see that uh, we're doing something with that. Of What are we doing? Are we doing an NCIB? Are we doing a, a dividend? Are we doing a mm -hmm. small tuck-in? What exactly will we be doing? Mm -hmm. I'll yeah. watch for that for sure. Um, listen, as we wrap up, is there any anything we forgot or is there any sort of key message you want to make sure that uh, we walk away with today? No, I think I think you've got everything there. We know we went over the YMA flex. That was my last slide. I think that kind of detailed uh, everything that people should be considering when they look at the uh, the stock price and uh, if they want to buy or not. Uh, but uh, um, I think that uh, I think that really covered it all. Yeah. Awesome. Well, John, this has been great. It's always it's always good to catch up. So I appreciate the time today. Uh, we've been speaking with John Ripplinger, uh, Vice President, uh, IMA Flex uh, Incorporated, IFX on the Venture Exchange. Uh, John, uh, until next time, uh, thanks for joining us and look forward to catching up next time. Well, thanks very much, Paul, Trevor, and, uh, and the SCD uh, gang. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye for now.